Why will data help Instacart succeed where Webvan and others failed years ago? Yeah, so Mac, there's a couple of reasons, and I like to think about it in two different ways. One, uh, Instacart's got a completely different fulfillment model. So Webvan had warehouses, they had refrigerated trucks. Yeah. So they were carrying all the inventory themselves. It's completely different with Instacart, where actually our warehouses are the retailers themselves. So the goods are already close to the customer. Instead of using refrigerated trucks, we use personal shoppers and they use their vehicles. So we've got a completely different model for fulfilling the groceries. Now, the interesting thing is that that model's not possible without data science, certainly not at scale. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to take all of these thousands of personal shoppers and understand exactly where they should be located and what stores they should shop at, how they should be routed. You have to be able to measure constantly everything that's happening with those shoppers and be able to ensure that they can move as efficiently and effectively as possible. So you just couldn't have done that fulfillment model yeah. without data science, which I think is an interesting part of the Instacart business model. Sure. It's kind of predicated on that. The, the other thing I, I think I'd point out on this is, we're really creating a better grocery shopping experience than in-store. It's not just more convenient. So the user interfaces are a lot better for shopping now than they were 15 years ago when Webvan tried to do this. We can personalize things, we can personalize search, we can make recommendations to you. When you search in a grocery store, you, you search with your two feet, right? It's a pretty labor intensive process. But here with our site, we can make everything instantly available to you and personalized to you based on data science. And that's just a, a much better shopping experience in the end. Mm -hmm. Can you share a specific example of how data science has improved efficiency at Instacart? Yeah, sure. So I'll highlight the fulfillment problem itself. And this is a place where we've been able to, I'll share the metrics first. So we always think about these things as there's both a primary metric and balancing metrics. And the primary metric in this case might be to improve the speed with which a shopper can fulfill an order. You know, from the time they go to the grocery store to the time that shows up at your doorstep. So if we can make that happen faster by being more efficient and routing and planning, uh, then it, our, our costs will be much lower and it will be a better experience for the shopper and for the customer. The balancing metric is we don't want to push lates up, i.e. we don't want to miss the delivery window by being too greedy and trying to jam too many things in, right? And so this is a case where we've been able to both decrease the time that it takes to fulfill an order by 20% and at the same time decrease late deliveries mm -hmm. by 20%. And so we did that with a couple of components. One of them is we have to be able to predict for all of the orders that are going to be due in the next five hours and all of the shoppers that we have potentially available to take those orders, how long is it going to take them to get to the store, to shop for the groceries, to go out and do delivery one, delivery two, delivery three. And those predictions are going to be based upon time and space, they're going to be based upon that individual shopper, the specifics of the order, obviously the customer's address, there's going to be all sorts of components that go into those things. And it's not just the average, for us it's really the distribution, because we don't want to be late, and in order not to be late we need to know how much variance there is in these steps as they, as they uh, sort of pack up, right? And so we've done a lot to be able to improve the quality of those models to predict you know, what's likely to happen if we were to route any given order to any given shopper. Then there's the problem of, well, now I've got to decide exactly who to route mm -hmm. to. And it's the traveling salesman problem being computed in real time and you know, evolved over and over and over again. And so that's a particularly challenging problem and we've had to blend all of these predictions with a lot of modern heuristics to be able to compute you know, the optimal delivery paths, or at least as close to optimal as we think and be able to balance these multiple objectives, like making sure that the delivery is done quickly, but also that it's on time. Uh, what other developments, uh, technologically, societally, have made this a good time for on-demand grocery delivery? Because mm -hmm. I, I ma imagine, you know, looking back 15 years ago, and looking to where we are now, state of the art of data science, rise of mobile, that kind of thing. Yeah, right, yeah, so we talked about data science, we talked about the rise of mobile. I think there are a, a few other interesting trends. Mm -hmm. One of them is consumers increasingly really want the long tail of groceries. Everybody's got their dietary preferences. They want gluten-free, they want this fat content level. Right. right. And they care about timeliness for groceries. It's one thing to get groceries delivered tomorrow, and that works for a subset of people that plan all of their meals out a week in advance. But not very many people do that anymore. We live you know, day to day, and we need to make uh, plans that are kind of adaptive and changing constantly. And so being able to think about how do you get groceries to someone in an hour, and along, allow them to shop from the long tail of all of the groceries that are available at your right. local Whole Foods, 
right? That's something that I think is particularly interesting to customers now. It might not have been as interesting 15 years ago. What do you see happening with data science and logistics over the next three years or so? Yeah. So I think that the integration of machine learning and heuristics such that you're really not just creating something that predicts what's going to happen, but optimizes for the best solution. I think that's a place that's a really fertile ground for innovation, and so we're going to get a lot better at that. I'll tell you a place that we haven't applied it as much is the in-store routing of the shoppers themselves. And so being able to measure their exact location in the store, identify exactly where products are, uh, ensure that we don't send them to go look for something in the store if it's not actually there. There's a whole bunch of interesting in-store problems that we'll be solving from a logistics and data science perspective. The other interesting angle is robotics itself. I don't know if three years is the right time horizon, but there's obviously a lot of interesting uh, opportunities to use robotics in business models like Instacart. Last question for you. What people or projects are you following these days? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, there's a, a few that I'll highlight. Uh, so one of them is uh, DeepMind and AlphaGo. I think that's probably pretty common for a lot of people. What I found, obviously it was an awe-inspiring accomplishment, but it also, really surprisingly to me, mirrored some of the challenges that Instacart is facing. You know, having to make predictions about exactly what's going to happen given you know, a tremendous number of potential combinations. Having to think about heuristics for search and optimization in conjunction with that having to think critically about the evaluation function. You know, what's the fitness of this specific delivery combination and path? Um, so really, it's interesting to look at all of the research that has gone into solving games and how relevant that research is to applied problems like the one that Instacart has. Mm. So I think that's one place. Um, a second one that I would highlight is, is Hadley Wickham and everything that he does. Uh, I'm just a fanboy of Hadley's. I've used R for a long time. Uh, I love that he's just now announced a collaboration with Wes McKinney on an R and Python you know, data exchange format. So Python and R are integrating more closely together. Uh, you know, Hadley, I think, has you know, revolutionized the practical aspect of doing data science. What might have taken me you know, a day 10 years ago takes me two minutes today, not because the computer has gotten faster, because the tools have gotten so much better. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about Hadley, is that he focuses on building tools that make the practicing data scientist's life better. Uh, I think another one I would highlight is, is Andy Grove. Obviously, you know, he's passed away, so I'm not following him anymore, but I still feel like I'm following him sure. uh, in learning from all of his um, uh, management uh, philosophy and teachings. It's interesting, you know, in data science, one of the big questions is how do you organize a data science team? And Andy Grove wrote about that you know, 15 years ago in managing organizations. He wasn't talking about data science, but he was talking about you know, when do you create mission-driven teams that have all of the skills they need to execute something versus centralized teams that consult. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a critical question for organizations today around how they think about where they put data scientists in their organization. And we've got a lot to learn from Andy. Great, well thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you, it was a pleasure.